Hey, this is Matt once again. Welcome back to the video. There's another paid request this time from Michael. Thank you so much for that. And for those interested in requesting any type of videos, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both things are down below in the info box. And this is for the 1968 film Targets, which I had heard about this film for quite a while. For the longest time, I had heard this, I guess, in like movie books either talking about horror movie actors or just movies of the past and this would be mentioned because number one is directed by Peter Bogdanovich who became a bit more of an acclaimed director later on these are the days he's worked with Roger Corman and his productions this is I think the last film Boris Karloff did one of the last maybe the last film at least the last prominent film Boris Karloff did before he passed away which is one of his best. Easily one of his best. And I think it helps because he's pretty much playing a version of himself. I have to think Boris Troloff thought this was so refreshing to do. Compared with all the other roles he got to do in his career. <laughs> Just for understand, this was part of a Corman production and deal where he had Boris Karloff under contract and he had to make a certain amount of movies and he had to do like maybe like three days work at least <clears throat> something like that so the director is like okay well I got this movie set up where Bor we show scenes from your other movies including the terror that was the film Boris Karloff did with Dick Miller and Jack Nicholson. That showed at the beginning. And then the projector shuts off. You realize it's people watching a film. One of them is his aging horror star, Byron Orlock, played by Boris Karloff. And pretty much his story is that he looks at these movies and he's kind of just done. He feels that he's an antique. He feels that he's out of date. And... A chunk of the film, it will go back between two stories. The one story is Boris Karloff like, deciding to retire. He doesn't even want to do this personal appearance at this drive-in. He's talked with his secretary. He's talked with this writer who... I think he, that's also played by the director, Peter Bogdanovich. He plays his... God, but I wrote this script. Like, oh, come on, you don't want to quit. And I just gave you the best script ever. Come on, you got to do it. <laughs> But he's not being too much of a ditch, but he, he's being like a fun bratty way. Like a fun brat. And Boris is like, listen, I got no more obligations, and it's quite relaxing. And there's, there's a twinkle in Boris Karloff's eye, there's a bit of a sense of humor. You can tell that Karloff, because of his career, you know, playing the villain and being Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein and like all these other movies. This was just a different refreshing role for him. And he's kind of, you, know, you get a lot of nice scenes of Boris Karloff contemplating his life. You know, if you want the Mr. Boogeyman, you get me. This person makes you cry. This person makes you smile. But Orlot, he makes you scream. I mean, look at what people call these movies nowadays. They call them high camp. You know what people are scared of? And he puts a newspaper down. It's like, youth kills six people in the supermarket. That's what people are afraid of now. They're not afraid of this. So you have that whole bit, which is much more of a funny warmth, but at the same time, you, you get this nice little story of a guy just kind of at the end of his rope, wondering what he's going to do next. Um, I actually wish we could have seen more of that. Just uh, We see a good chunk of it. It's not like it's only five minutes, thankfully. But I'm just so interested, because I like Boris Karloff as an actor. It was just nice to see him do something that refreshing and get a really good script. Like uh, the way his dialogue is with other characters and his banter with his secretary or 
the the writer character while that's happening you have this guy named Bobby who seems like a nice guy calm quiet guy got a mom a dad a wife get buys a gun at the gun shop back to the day when you just go to a gun shop yeah give me a gun give me bullets oh yeah I've been here a lot with my dad he's aiming at people he's a tartar practice one day he warns his wife I don't know just lately I've been getting these funny ideas but his wife is being nice his mom's being nice no one's it's not the typical the wife is bickering or the mom is this evil you know psycho Norman Bates type of mom it's just everything's fine until out of the blue kills his wife kills his mom even the guy helping his mom with groceries he leaves a note there's no why no there's no why as to why I became this way which a lot of times you don't know why and that could be perhaps scarier compared to the monsters that Boris Karloff or I should say Byron Orlock played you know the monsters of the modern world seem scarier seem much more terrifying you know they don't have makeup and monster they just a guy is a normal guy who seemed nice. How, how many times have you heard that? He seemed like a nice guy. Ed Dean, Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, all those. He seemed like a nice guy. <laughs> I thought the director did a good job going back and forth so it didn't feel like one was neglected compared to the other story. It didn't feel like, oh, it feels like we've been with this for 20 minutes, then we go back for 5 minutes. No, they seem fair in going back and forth. The way the, the scenes are set up of the shootings, there's very little to no music, except if it's in any cars or background. So it kind of makes the scenes feel a bit more realistic. A lot of times the sniper scenes, you'll see through the scope. So you get in his POV of the scope as he's shooting people, random cars, on a freeway, just picking random. Kind of like, probably based on, for example, Charles Whitman. Crazy fucker that just decided to shoot people. And you see his point of view of the sniper, like, hidden. Now it's not, it's not bloody, like, you're not going to see brains explode or anything. It's not that kind of movie. It's 1968. But you, you do get those elements. And I will say it's a bit funny. Uh, actually, uh, I just want to chat someone quit. Just want to check something. You know, this was 1968. I want to double check the, the year. And there are times where the, the scope remind me of like the John F. Kennedy assassination. I think that was on purpose of why the director had those type of shots through the scope. Kind of like the Sapruder film. Yeah, just the way the director shot it, where it's like no nonsense, no filler, and kind of like no out of the blue music to ruin what was going on. And uh, yeah, it made it feel a little bit more realistic. He gets found out. He kills a few more people, has to go to another location, and then now all these two stories don't collide where the drive-in that Boris Karloff was not going to do, but ultimately he does do it because he feels guilty, wants to help out some of the people, including his secretary. 
he ultimately does do it and at the same time the sniper is there and I didn't the way the sniper I guess I don't know there are times he's shooting in the drive-in theater I kind of wonder why no one's hearing the gunshots maybe because back then like the speakers are right next to you so maybe you wouldn't hear them like you know you're in the car and the speakers if they're right here blaring but it I guess it threw me off because you don't hear much of the movie they're watching like they're watching the terror the Boris Karloff because that's the only one well it's two they showed one on TV kind of an old and I think it was Howard Hawks and Boris Karloff's like yeah that was one of the roles that well it was, sorry Byron Orlock that was one of the roles that really helped me out which is funny that you know it's it this it's this oh the Boris Karloff and there's never mention of Frankenstein but probably because they couldn't get footage of Frankenstein because it's still a low budget corn production and so it is what it is but still like we can only get footage of what we can like it says here the Bobby was an unhinged Vietnam vet I didn't even realize he was a Vietnam vet. Because they don't go too adamant on that. Like I say, they don't go really that much into the the why. But yeah, the sniper scenes are, are effective, suspenseful. You don't know who he's shooting randomly. A lot of times you see through the, the sniper scope, whether the projection, projection booth guy or people in the cars. And again, you don't know what will happen next. And it shows kind of the difference between, you know, how things were back in the day compared to now. You know, definitely after, you know, Vietnam and the race riots and, and everything in between. It's much more violent compared to the 50s and, and such. I mean, I wouldn't say it was a piece of cake back then. You had World War One, World War Two, the Great Depression. You know, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows either but yeah that's why you have all these monsters monster movies and then again when this stuff happens it's like can I really be steered by Frankenstein or nowadays it'd be Freddy Krueger or Jason when this person you know shop a movie theater it's like well that seems a bit scarier than Jason Voorhees and super spoilers I do love uh, when the sniper is trying to get away. It wounds Boris, uh, his friend's, his secretary friend, wounds her. And he sees the sniper. And like a boss, he just goes up to him. And the guy's like freaked out because he's seen Boris Karloff on the movie screen. And I've seen him there. And he's freaking out. And Boris Karloff gets wounded. He just keeps going. Just hits the guy. Slaps the shit out of him. Gives him a bitch slap. <laughs> A fucking bitch slaps him from here to Timbuktu. Slaps the shit out of him. To the point that the guy's like now steered and afraid. And even he goes, that's what I was afraid of? Because that's the thing a lot of times if you, you know, these guys will hurt people, do stuff to people, take a lot of people's lives. But if you actually try to get them in a one-on-one -on -one situation... They didn't talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk, and that's why a lot of these people, they either end up blowing their brains out or doing other shit because they're more scared than anything. They're not as tough as, is. yeah, it's tough when you got a rifle and you're a sniper far, far away. Try being hand-to-hand -hand with these, like Johnny Witherspoon said in Friday. You win some, or you lose some. But you live to fight another day. Take all the aggressions out with this, and then let's see how tough you are. You know, that type of thing. 
And it kind of ends with the cops come and they both separate and they go off their day and nice quiet kind of spooky shot of the kind of the empty parking lot of the drive-in and I think you only see like one car there and then the movie's over. Like it's pretty... It's one of those things where both stories are told fairly in an effective manner. The sniper bits, the acting didn't seem over the top, it didn't get... In this case, not knowing the why I think was beneficial. He's just losing it. He just lost it. You know, like the guy in Silent Rage, you know. Did we really find out why he was crazy? It was just crazy. But there was no Chuck Norris because he wasn't an experiment gone awry. He wasn't invincible. If he was, then Boris Karloff would have to go get Chuck Norris, bring him over. There you go. Chuck Norris and Boris Karloff in double targets. <laughs> double the target. Double the death. Double the damage. Hold your breath. Boris Karloff and Chuck Norris in Double Targets. Rated R. I would have seen that movie. But yeah, it was a nice swan song for Boris Karloff. You got to play. I just wish, if it was that they only had Karloff for only a few days, they definitely, I mean, then the, the director definitely did what he could with that. Because Boris is in the film quite a bit. It doesn't feel like, oh, he was only on for three days. This is a good chunk of the movie. But I do wish it was just a normal production where... I don't know. I guess he... I mean, it's not like he's Liam Neeson. He's going to go and fight him like Liam Neeson. If Liam Neeson did this... Okay, if there was a remake of this film, Liam Neeson, Liam Neeson would be the one getting into a fist fight and... Even though he's like 70 years old, doing a fist fight, and you know. <laughs> so it doesn't need to be that type of movie. I just, I was just enjoying it, so I was just greedy for more. But I, I, I thought it was pretty good for what it needed to be. Like I said, if you. I don't know, if you like these type of movies, if you're a fan of Boris Karloff, it's definitely worth a look. I thought it was well directed. I thought the sniping scenes definitely had a. Nice, tense suspense uh, feel to him. Again, the lack of music. Is after a while, I'm like, yeah, there's not much music in it. It, it made it feel more real. Uh, Karloff, uh, it was, they gave him some nice dialogue, bits of humor, and humanity. It's a fairly short film. It's only like 90 minutes long. Doesn't overstay his welcome. And, uh, overall, pretty good movie. I was, I didn't, I had heard about uh, th this film for quite a while, and nice to see it was not disappointing. So that was nice. Just don't, just don't go in expecting this big action thriller. You still, it's not that kind of movie at all. But, still a good one. So with that said, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys later.